Hi everyone. Uh, I just want to give a quick shout out. Um, so I, uh, as Julie mentioned, I run the um, New York uh, Design Systems Coalition. Um, there's one here too, and Gina's right here. So if you're interested in that, you should um, you should hit her up, and that's where it started. Gina. So <laughs> yeah, wave, wave. <laughs> in the front row. Um, so. I hope you're all familiar with the um, expanding brain um, meme because that definitely influenced the theme of my talk. Um, I'm not that serious about like brain illustrations and stuff, so. <laughs> um, but yeah, if not, Google that and then you can laugh at my uh, slides later. Oh no, and there's a, a font not working. That's going to be a GitHub logo. Cool. <laughs> so it works. It works. <laughs> So design systems, <laughs> what's design systems? Um, so <laughs> that's why we're all here and I'll tell you. Um, so uh, I work on design systems at GitHub um, and uh, manage a team of only two. Um, but uh, our team is um, formed like an open source project. So we have uh, three core maintainers who are full time. Um, uh, I'm included in that. And then we have seven uh, contributors who are based, who are spread across different teams at GitHub on product design, web and creative. Um, we have an engineer on the team. And that helps us um, make sure that we keep um, feeding back um, what we're learning through design systems to them. And they can feed back what they're learning on working on their projects to us. And so that, that format has, is, has worked really well for us so far. So a bit of context. Um, uh, GitHub is almost um, 10 years old. Um, uh, so that's you know, almost 10 years of, of code contributions. Um, we, right now we have 669 um, employees. Um, a, well over 300 of them are active code contributors. And we have 30 designers um, spread across product and creative and web design. Um, 23 of those are people that actively and regularly contribute either to um, github.com or other websites that we have. Um, and I'm pretty sure that more than that actually do code, but that's not maybe a core part of their job. So you can imagine that um, with that many um, years of code being added and um, that many people contributing um, both on engineering and design that that starts to build up um, quite um, a, a potential mess I guess or, or chaos um, without with the lack of something like a design systems team sort of focusing on the UI side of things. So uh, where do you start? Um, when I um, started at GitHub I started on product design and um, just over a year ago, I um, became full-time on um, the design systems team. So we're still pretty new. And looking at all this, all this code iteration, um, it's difficult to know where to begin sometimes. So, you know, do you start with typography, spacing, color? Do you start by auditing, like, all the things? Um, that's not necessarily wrong. But where you really want to start is with why. Like, why do we need design systems? And why do we need a dedicated team doing this? Like, what are the problems? So when I began looking at this um, early 2016, I could see that there had been numerous iterations of um, GitHub style guides. The most recent um, of which is Primer, which was open sourced in 2015. But um, that had been used internally for, for quite a while. But there were problems with this. And um, whilst there was primer, there were like tons and tons of undocumented styles. Um, and there was piles and piles of CSS um, inside the GitHub app that was just not documented and not part of primer at all. And GitHub uses SAS, um, but there wasn't really um, uh, much consistency. They weren't even using things like variables to tie this system together. So I'm going to talk about where our design systems team um, began and what worked for us. So on the edge of chaos, looking at all this code, I really took this theme and rolled with it. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, between the, 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 spa the space between order and, and disorder, um, where did we begin? Well, we set some goals. And our two, like, these are very high level goals, and I'm totally happy to answer more questions later, but 
Uh, one of our main goals was to just improve that design and development workflow. It was with all that code and, and so many undocumented styles, um, and also with not very flexible styles within Primer, um, engineers and designers were spending a lot of time figuring out how should I write this SAS and how should this thing be styled. It wasn't a fast process. Um, and that also was a con contributor to CSS bloat. Um, there was a lot of styles that um, didn't need to be written, but they didn't know that they existed because it wasn't documented. Um, and we also wanted to increase consistency. Um, we felt that would be good for user experience, but also good for the decision process of design. So we started with utilities based on systems. Um, some people call the utilities atomic classes. Some people talk about functional CSS. Utilities are one type of style in, in Primer. Um, they do one thing and one thing only. But what, the reason we started with them um, is that we could start to um, figure out our systems and we could add this um, utilities um, into the code base without kind of like uplifting and ripping out the foundations of everything else that was there. Um, and based on systems means that we started to develop um, a systematic scale for things like spacing. And so each utility would map to um, those variables and that would map to a scale. Um, we, w we didn't have any scales really in the code base. There was a lot of um, five and 10 pixels sort of margin and padding on things. And we looked at, uh, we found some problems with that because um, like 10 is not a very highly composable number. It doesn't add up to and break down very nicely. And so we ended up moving to an eight based um, pixel scale um, for spacing because that arrived on like sensible like whole even numbers in a lot more places. Similarly, we um, worked on a typography scale that was as much as possible based on powers of two and we looked at how that worked in conjunction with um, line height. You can't just look at just typography on its own, you've got to look about how it works within other parts of its related system and how that works across um, the rest of the code base. And so we tried to find um, a system, um, that, a scale that worked, that arrived again on, on whole numbers as much as possible. At the same time, we had to work with an existing code base, um, and we were trying to iterate towards um, a better state of things. So my advice there is, is to choose um, what I'm just going to call sensible systems, um, systems that feel easy and harmonious to work with. Um, but also you've got to choose systems that work for your context. Um, some other websites might have go up in like, uh, uh, like 16 pixels and, and 32 and things like that. Um, but for GitHub, it's very dense. And so for our typography scale and our spacing scale, um, we needed something that worked for us. So while we were adding all these utilities, we also um, made sure that we documented everything. We didn't want to add to our sort of undocumented style kind of debt. Um, and so that was, that was really important. And that led to um, this sort of faster sort of um, feedback loop as you were building out designs and faster process for implementing design. Because people, A, knew the actual styles existed because we documented them. And then also there was a lot of things that they could work with to make small tweaks and iterations that they could just use straight out the bat. And so that's what um, utilities started to afford us. And we started to get um, uh, responses like this. Um, this is from an engineer. Um, he said that they felt like they had superpowers using these, these, this new part of the system, which is awesome. Um, he actually did say he was like kind of like hesitating about telling other people about the new style guide and about the new system because <laughs> he felt like everyone thought he was amazing. But that's great. I want everyone. <laughs> I want, I want, but I do want other people to know. Um, but that's great, you know. I, I do want people to feel like they have superpowers. But that that was also like a sign of like how bad things uh, may have been in the past. Is that he it was such a, a small update made such a big impact, um, and that brings me to um, this point, which is I think um, I hear a lot of talk about a lot of people ask me questions about how do you get buy-in um, to to build systems and support from management, how do you get to have a full-time team? And some of this work we started before we were an official full-time team. And I think in the early stages, it's really important to find the things that are not only solving the problem, 
um, but that give you kind of quick wins that very f as fast as possible show show your value. Um, <laughs> <bing>. uh, <laughs> um, and also, you know, uh, make a big impact, solve people's biggest pain points, so that you get people starting to say things like, this feels like um, I have superpowers. Because that, that filters through, that filters up to management, and that's helpful, and that, help, that helps you build the case for, like, this is valuable, this is needed. And related to that, um, I'm not, it's a little bit small here, but um, I, I started to plot, like, um, our projects against the axes of like, was this project um, more directly benefiting customers of GitHub or was it benefiting the staff at GitHub? Um, is it maintenance, which often means it's invisible work, um, it often means refactoring and things like that? Or was it innovative? Was it adding a new cool thing, helpful thing um, to people? Or was it adding tooling and, and stuff like that that made the workflow easier? And I found, um, you know, I, I didn't get things right the whole way through um, this um, experience. And sometimes I spent too much time on invisible work. And sometimes I spent too much time not dealing with um, the technical debt. And it's really important to uh, make sure that you don't spend all your time in, in one, one of these quadrants. Um, you've got to sh do stuff that's visible, but you can't ignore um, that sort of maintenance because that's baggage that you're carrying around with you. Um, so when we're prioritizing projects, we try and break them up into small chunks so that we can kind of move around these different areas. So, uh, more sparks in the brain here. Um, finding patterns in the chaos. So I mentioned refactoring and I think uh, I'd like to share some very practical things that I've learned from that. Um, uh, of course, writing a talk about um, chaos, I read at least two paragraphs on Wikipedia about um, chaos theory. <laughs> um, uh, this was a, a, a quote that I've slightly edited, but um, I really, it really resonated, resonated with me. Um, within the apparent randomness of chaotic systems, um, there are underlying patterns, repetition, um, self-similarity, and self-organization. And I was like, that is how I feel when I start to really deeply look at, um, at, at our CSS. Uh, and so I've, over some time and some trial and error, I've developed some approaches that have, have helped me uh, you know, find the patterns in the chaos and make sense of that. So one, um, and this is where auditing does come in. There is a, a, po a point at which you might need to kind of audit your patterns. Um, uh, I think it's, it's really helpful to look at what are the like, most common patterns, what are things that are really popular but are not um, well defined, have not been codified in a component, have not got documentation. And for me, that was boxes at GitHub. We had like seven plus, I think we, I found more after this, um, different box patterns. Um, in, and I noticed this through clicking around the UI uh, because I don't know if you've if you look at GitHub, there's a lot of stuff in boxes. Um, it's like, <laughs> um, there's all, yeah. So, and then there was like all these different um, styles for them that didn't really need to, I don't know whose ping that is, <laughs> that didn't need to um, have um, that many different um, ways to style that same thing. And so I started to audit that and look at um, uh, the, the, the similarities between all these patterns and make one box component to rule them all. Um, so that's one way that um, we could tackle refactoring. We could look at this pattern. There's all these um, kind of different variations we want to kill um, and start to tackle that um, part, SAS partial by SAS partial and um, UI element by UI element. <laughs> um, so sometimes I think, and I, I feel like, especially as designers, but um, I think it's sometimes it's easier to work in pages or, or views. And um, you can look at this page and go, I'm going to make this nice again. Um, and ironically, uh, one of the efforts that sprung up um, with um, contributors on the design system team and some product designers was um, the great unboxing. Um, so I was working on boxes, other people were working on unboxing things, um, but that's cool. Um, at least the boxes we do have will be nice. 
Uh, so um, a, a group of designers um, focused on all our settings pages and um, started to unbox them. And a few um, small um, projects like spun out of that. They started to notice patterns there that got folded back into the design system. And that was a really nice um, way for them to work because they could compare each other's work and follow similar um, layouts. So sometimes that's a good way to approach things. Sometimes it's hard to just look at a component across every instance. Um, another method, um, I mentioned variables, like once you've got those scales established, uh, an obvious and easy thing, maybe not easy all the time, but an obvious thing to do is to make sure as much of um, the code base is using um, that, those variables because that's a way to um, spread that system and to um, bring consistency. And so we've got um, a few efforts um, where we are working on our typography variables and making sure every like font de declaration uses variables, making sure our colors use variables, which I'll talk a bit more about later, and making sure um, uh, all our spacing uses those variables. And we found that you know it's definitely easy to start with, OK, this is an exact um, match in terms of what the value is and just swap those out. But you start, the more you dig into it and the more you start to normalize things, you start to notice all sorts of other things about um, your code base and start to notice other patterns. So it's a really interesting way to look um, at your styles. And then the other thing that took me a little while to um, realize after some uh, very uh, kind of rabbit hole-ish um, pull requests um, I realized that I didn't need to update everything um, to bring it up to the standards that I wanted to in one go. Um, so as well as introducing variables, we introduced a new naming convention for both utilities and, and our components, which follow BEM syntax. And we also um, had wrote our, down our principles, um, which I implore you all to do, um, to describe what our SAS should look like. Um, and also, we've, I've started working on documentation for how to write documentation, because everything about <laughs> design systems is meta. Um, but there's varying levels of quality of documentation. And you don't have to necessarily do that all in one go, um, because they can turn into very um, huge pull requests, difficult to review, and end up staying open for a long time. So, um, find, so I think it's like, yeah, find the places that you can um, break that stuff down and, and do really small small ships and, and look for those patterns across whether it's a, a, a something like typography or a larger component or pages and um, organize stuff like that. So more sparks and lightning are flying now. We're going to enter into the chaos. Um, I wanted to do a, a mini deep dive into um, the color system work to, sh to show you what um, building a system um, might look like. Um, and if, you've used, if you use GitHub, you may have noticed when, when that happened um, earlier this year. So again, like earlier, I say it's really important to start with why. Why are we even doing this? So one of the reasons for us was that our colors were looking a little drab. And they were looking a bit dull and um, a dad, uh, dub, dub, blue, dad, jeans, blue. Um, and we were like, we, 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 it might be time for a refresh. Another issue was that um, we had a lot of color combinations that were not passing color contrast. We didn't have good guidelines around that and we didn't have a good um, scale and variations of color. And that's not good. But the really big problem was that we had 2,449 hex values that were not connected in any way. Um, I, it, like, now that I look back on this, it amazes me. I'm like, how did anyone know how to use color at all? Um, and I guess, well, they didn't. I mean, if you, we're still working on this. You can, if you click around too much on GitHub, you'll notice this. So that's a problem. Um, having that many values that are not tied into a system um, it's a huge overhead in terms of maintenance. It makes it hard to make changes really easily, and it makes it hard for people to know how to use color in the, in the right way, in a consistent way. So I'll talk through how I approach designing the, the color system. So similarly to product design, I started off by researching what already existed. 
and looking at how color was used um, across the UI um, so that I could understand what I needed to like look out for and test and what we felt happy with or didn't feel happy with. Um, and then I started to reach out, uh, research outside of our system. Um, these are not all the systems I looked at, but they're the ones that are most different. Um, so I thought it was really interesting. The um, uh, National Health Service in the UK um, talks about um, like how like moderate use of color um, and how much to use color, um, which is really nice and something I would like to add to our style guide. BuzzFeed um, have um, utilities similar to us and they're named with like sort of functional class names like fill and text. Um, material design, which I am sure all of you have seen, um, has huge amounts of colors. There are so many colors. Um, and they, they um, have a scale that runs through them um, with numbers, but they also have um, some that start with A, which I assume stands for alt for alternative. Um, and then uh, US web standards, they give like priority to their color names by call calling them things like primary and secondary. So then I started to uh, make lists of like how people describe color and group them. And I looked at things that were not design systems too, like photo editing apps. And I found it really, I started to, I found it really interesting because I was like, do we want to have like green and light green and dark green and darker green? And I know there's been lots of tweets about grays and um, things like that. Um, and then I was like, or oh, do we, and do we want like, you know, things like indigo and violet? Because I mean, around this time, of course, I started reading Interaction of Color by Joseph Albers. And he has this quote about like, if, if um, one says red in the room, everyone will have like a different idea of what that red will be. I really simplified that quote, but um, it, you know, every, what my interpretation of indigo and violet was, was very different to what I saw some other de designers calling indigo and violet. And I was like, I feel like we want to stay away from those um, sorts of color names. And so, so I noticed some systems calling things like dark blue and light blue and things. So. Um, yeah, there's like a lot of ways to name color, and then there's also purpose. So, like um, the US web standards, they have like primary, secondary, and things like that. Um, so, um, that helped me think through what I, I felt like was practical and helpful, and some of these things I did end up using. I also um, thought a bit about like where is the base, where's the default value of this color? Is it, is it the first one or is it in the middle? Um, and one of my earlier iterations, um, I had um, numbered it just one through to, I don't know why eight, but that's what I had at the time. Um, and I started with the default being at the first value and then going lighter and darker and in, into border colors. And this just confused everybody. Everyone wanted to see this nice gradiated scale of dark to light. And so this is not all our colors, but this is like kind of roughly where we ended up with our, our variable system. So fairly similar to um, material design, um, slight, slightly different way of numbering things, but we went with the sort of 500 value as being our base default value and going lighter and darker from that. Um, we stayed away from having um, things like alt colors and in our base um, color values, we don't use things like light and dark. Um, and so this number means the same thing in, in every context. While designing the system, I also created like constraints and rules around that as well. Um, so um, I, I felt like we had to have some constraints around what qualified, like what were the requirements for something to be a base color. And for me, at minimum, it was that um, the, um, it had to work with either white or our body font color, which is a dark gray, and pass a minimum of, of large text, because I know that we use, in some places, large bodies of color for backgrounds and things. And then within a color family, the lightest, you can't see probably, but this is very light um, red on a dark red background, but within a set, I felt like we needed to have this constraint that they both work together and passed because I know that we use color like that. And then I also um, had a set of um, common color combinations that I needed to make pass. Um, we have a lot of grays in GitHub, and in some instances, the blue link color was not passing on that, so I needed to make sure those things worked. 
And then I started to map those base variables to, to what I can't think of a better name called uh, functional variables, which describe their function. Um, this is not complete, this work yet, but the reason for doing this is so that we understand um, what that color is doing. And this can be helpful with things like theming and stuff in the future. So that's something we're working towards. Um, and those um, functional variables are then used in our utilities and components and unfortunately custom styles. So the work of building um, the palette was uh, definitely time consuming and definitely hard work. So I used a number of tools because um, uh, there wasn't one that did everything I wanted it to. Um, so I used Colorable um, by Brent Jackson um, for testing color contrast and also I ended up using it to test like is this is I think this color is similar to the new variable. So when I was updating stuff, I would paste the two in there to see how similar they were. I used um, colors with uh, three R's, I think, <laughs> to convert um, RGBA values to hex values. Um, and then at, at one point, I started looking at luminosity as a value of color um, because I started to notice these interesting bends in, in the scale of um, saturation as colors got lighter and darker. And some colors needed to um, get more saturated, some needed to become less saturated. And so I was initially trying to find a programmatic way of like creating these scales. And I looked at luminosity and it was an interesting um, aspect to look at it, but I, it didn't quite work for me. There wasn't like a um, programmatical solution for me, but uh, I also could spend more time on this and maybe there is a way. Um, and I also use Color Snapper just for color picking and checking stuff as I was updating it. And then importantly, um, we use um, red, um, green, and um, purple and to indicate status a lot across GitHub. So I used a tool called Spectrum for testing color deficiency. Um, and luckily, we actually have um, a couple of um, people with color blindness deficiencies um, at GitHub that I can ping to get feedback as well. But that was really important. Um, I think we still need some improvements there, but um, it was important to make sure that um, status was readable by everybody. So my workflow ended up looking a bit like this. <laughs> it's like <laughs> review the, the current, so when I'm like implementing this, I'm like reviewing the current color, um, testing the new base color, tweaking it, um, deploying this to our staging environment, posting screenshots on PRs, getting feedback from the team. Um, it was a lot of tweaking and testing and I'm lucky that I have a lot of uh, great colleagues that helped me uh, get this tested and, and pushed out the door. So where did we end up? Um, how did, what was our final set of colors? Well, I bet you can barely tell the difference, right? <laughs> Especially because this is on a projector. Um, this is so funny because um, there was a, a bit of reaction to our color update, but we weren't really trying to like um, create a whole new palette. We were just trying to, you might be able to see uh, there's a little bit more saturation in the new color. We were trying to up the contrast, make it more vibrant. And of course, um, whenever GitHub updates its UI, people have thoughts about it. Um, I'm kind of okay with this. I'm like, <laughs> sweet. <laughs> This is how I want to feel like when I'm using GitHub. <laughs> so uh, back to interaction of color. Um, you know, color is the most relative medium of art. I'm not saying product design is art, but um, I, I related to this um, statement. Um, what was interesting me, for me to, to learn, and it, it seems so obvious now, is like there's only so much that we can control. We can choose what the palette is. We can kind of choose the composition. Um, we know what elements we're putting on the page. Obviously, um, data changes that slightly, but you know we, we kind of know what's happening there. And what we can't control is people's opinions of color. We can't um, change um, what device someone is looking at color on. Uh, we can't tell whether they're using GitHub in the sunlight on their phone. And we can't control whether they um, have color deficiencies. But this is all stuff that we can test for and test for and test for and also get feedback from users um, from and that's stuff we've been listening to. And the other thing is like with, um, you know, depending on what product you're working on for us, GitHub 
we realize it's a utility for many people. Not for everybody, but for some people, it's something that they use every day just to get their work done. And making changes can be disruptive to them. Um, and so I think it's important to be intentional about whether those updates are invisible um, or you're trying to iterate to something better. And then sometimes um, we do have to choose to, to rip the Band-Aid off. And that's what we kind of had to do with color. And we also did when we updated our site to system fonts. Um, there wasn't really going to be a way we could like sneak that in with stuff without stuff looking kind of weird. So through these experiences, um, I'd like to answer this question because I get asked it a lot. It's like, where, like what size your company has to be? Like how big your product? Like when should you start building a design system? Well, if there's anything that like uh, like 5,449 hex values taught me, it's like you should just start uh, like as early as possible. Um, so yeah, that's the lesson there. Okay, not too much too much further to go. We're on the last like expanding brain section now. Um, <laughs> so now we're going to live with the chaos. Um, so again, this I mostly learned this through color, and I've kept it in my mind ever since. Is like. Yeah, when you're looking at the, all these um, like hex refs, like um, I, I'm, I was like, oh god, how how am I going to update all this in one go? This is a, this is, and then I was like, yeah, that's actually impossible. There's no way I'm going to be able to do that um, uh, unless I just have a PR open for like months and months. But there was other things that were um, like kind of forcing that timeline. So I found it helpful to to prioritize highly used components. Um, iconic um, parts of the UI that people like relate to GitHub with and frequently visited pages. So as an example, things like buttons, obviously people, those are like, like really commonly used components across GitHub, our statuses, uh, our state labels, um, things like alerts. So that was like definitely a core focus and luckily at that stage a lot of it was in primer. And then things like this, the contributions graph, um, I think you actually can see a bit of a difference there, but no, I saw hardly any tweets about that. People barely noticed that that got updated, which to me was a success because it felt like it fitted with the UI, but um, it didn't look completely wrong and different. And then pages that like um, people visit a lot, um, their their repo list, and um, lots of people um, noticed that we changed um, some colors around the icons on this page, and we we iterated on that based on feedback because it wasn't working for people. And then things like, yeah, our home page. And at the same time as I was building this system, the web design team were working on um, redesigning our home pages and feature pages. So they were using the colors in illustrations as I was still building the system. So this is actually what got updated in the first chip. Like 23% of the code base or like our, our SAS styles um, got updated um, in that first color chip. But it actually felt like a lot more than that. I, I made up the 80% mark, but like it felt like it felt like most of GitHub got updated. Um, so I think that's a really interesting thing to think about, and it can help you to um, prioritize when you are doing large-scale UI updates. So yeah, figure out what like how much needs to be updated um, for things to feel new, and um, that can help you. So in summary, um, early on. Um, find um, the quick wins, the things that will make a big impact and win you friends. Um, try and break things up into um, small ships. It's helpful for your happiness and, and when you're looking at this big pile of stuff you have to update and it's helpful for visibility of the work that your team's doing. Um, build systems as soon as you can. Start building them as you're building out your product and um, design systems should be built for change. That's kind of the point. Um, so it's not too early to start building them out. And um, yeah, when you're prioritizing and if you are in a state of introducing a system into a new code base, figure out um, how much you really need to do um, to make it feel new. And last of all, embra embrace the chaos. <laughs> so I really just wanted to use this GIF because it's yeah. awesome. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>